Welcome to Mornings with Mike. Public Safety Today. Grab a coffee and sign up to receive your call-in information. Be a part of the show. For more information at any time, please visit www.tapsd.org. Now, let's get started with your host, Mike Pazesny. Then we take a look at something about gangs that isn't talked about that much, and that's girl gangs. Girl gangs, interesting, generally misunderstood little subset of the overall gang culture. According to the National Youth Gang Survey, gangs are primarily comprised of male members, right? Uh, Less than 10% of the known gang members are girls. However, gangs with girl members are more common than just girl-only gangs. And the percentage of female gang members to male gang members, even though there are girl-only gangs as well as girls in gangs, uh, is really not all that great. So what's the complexity surrounding girl gangs versus co-ed gangs? Walter Miller in 75 tried to figure that out. He created three categories to describe girl gangs. You had a girl-only gang, which uh, was affiliated with a male gang. You had a girl-only gang with no affiliation with a male gang. And then you'd have a co-ed gang. And Miller argued that the girl-only gangs with no affiliation were about non-existent. More recent research finds that girl-only gangs are more prevalent than when Miller conducted his studies, because that was, believe it or not, 35 years ago, 40 years ago. However, the prevalence of all girl gangs is still lower than those considered co-ed or mixed. The most controversial aspect of girl gang members is the role they play within their gang. Uh, The Office of Juvenile Justice, Delinquency Prevention, sponsored a series of publications on youth gangs, and Moore and Hagedorn in 2001 uh, published a finding called Female Gangs, a Focus on Research. And they noted that the most early reports focused on whether female gangs were actually real gangs, or what they referred to as satellites of male groups. Instead of seeing girl gang members as equal to the males, a lot of them saw girl gang members as just sex toys or tomboys who basically were drug mules or weapon carriers for their male members. And we see a lot of this within the schools where the male, uh, the males who have drugs within the schools will have their female counterparts, their girlfriends, uh, carry the drugs for them. Because typically, if somebody's going to have their backpack searched, or if they're going to be checked, or if the locker's going to be checked, it's going to be a male youth, not a female youth. We still have a paternal kind of mindset when it comes to our schools, and a certain amount of naivete when it comes to understanding just how devious the female population can be. Sorry, ladies. So in reality, studies show that the rates of delinquency among these female gang members are higher than non-gang members, duh. The exact role that they play, though, we really can't figure out. Some studies suggest that girl gang members are subordinate to male members. Uh, Others suggest that the subordinates that the girls have to the males differs by race or ethnicity. For example, some suggest that Latina girl gang members may be more subordinate uh, to their males than girl gang members who are in African-American gangs. Other studies suggest that girl gang members are fully integrated. They play an equal role. Uh, For example, there was a study of drug dealing uh, dealing gangs in Philadelphia, which found that the girl members were highly active in the drug trafficking rings there in Philly. So it's important to recognize there's differences and similarities when examining the pathways that lead girls into gangs. Uh, Morin Hagerton, again, in 2001, suggested a number of reasons that girls might choose the gang life. Economic poverty is a risk factor for both boys and girls, meaning, excuse me, that those who come from impoverished backgrounds are more likely to seek out gangs, right? Either for economic survival or for protection as a second family because the parents are unavailable. In terms of differences, some suggest that girl gang members appear to have significantly higher incidents of sex abuse and trauma in their past. They may experience continued sexual abuse from other members of the gang after joining, but at least they feel as though they're with a family unit pretty sad. Uh, Regardless of these differences, however, there's a clear need for a lot of other studies to help to examine these issues. And I hope that 
the students that I have here in seminars, you grow into the criminal justice system, that you become some of those researchers that help us to better understand these problems. One of the key features of gangs is their involvement in criminal activity. The criminal element is important for a lot of different reasons, but most notably to help organize prevention and detection techniques to reduce gang membership. And understanding the role of the gang in criminal activity is important to being able to reduce overall crime levels in this country. So let's take a look at gang-related gang crime. If we look at the latest statistics that are available, we see the gang members are responsible for a disproportionately high amount of the violent crime that's committed every year. If we just look at the raw numbers, juveniles affiliated with a gang commit more violent crimes than juveniles who aren't affiliated with a gang. In fact, research, <coughs> excuse me, research suggests that gang members commit 68 to 85% of the serious violent crime committed by juveniles. Uh, the National Youth Gang Survey makes the following estimation. This is a quote. In a typical year in the so-called gang capitals of Chicago and Los Angeles, about half of all homicides are gang related. These two cities alone accounted for one in five gang homicides recorded in the National Youth Gang Survey from 2006 to 2010. And that was effective, the gang survey of 2012. So these, this gang-related crime in the terms of the violence that they generate and in, in terms of the homicides that they generate is phenomenal when you compare it to the overall crime in the same categories. The National Gang Threat Assessment Survey results from 2011 indicated that up to 48% of the violent crime committed in this country every year is attributable to gangs. And in some cities, it's higher than 48%. So even though we know that gang members contribute disproportionately to the crime rate, the other issue that we have to examine is the extent to which the criminal behavior is gang-related or just committed by one individual who's affiliated with a gang but whose criminal behavior is unrelated to the gang at all. For example, if a youth steals from a convenience store and they're arrested by the police for the crime and they're known to be a folk member, the police could record this as a gang-related crime. So we have to, you know, in the theoretical world, we could say, gee, we need to try to make sure that we don't include this as a gang crime because it had nothing to do with the gang. But we're drawing the data from the police departments and it's the way that the data puts the data together. So if we can't agree on what the definition of a gang is, we're probably not be going to be able to agree on how to process the records of those who were associated with the group. Does that make sense? So one of the most interesting issues to de is determining the features of the gangs that seem to drive or increase the likelihood of criminal behavior. So if we talked about gang members being more likely to commit crime, particularly the violent crime, right? Well, then what's the driving forces behind the statistics that tell us this? And it turns out that there's some prominent features that influence these rates. First, uh, there is the, you know, the social learning theory, birds of a feather flock together kind of idea on gang membership. Uh, Like-minded, violence-prone youth typically will seek one another out, reinforce each other's violent or aggressive behavior because that's what, the, that's what they train each other to do. That's what they learn from each other. Secondly, a popular theory about gang involvement in crime is referred to as the social contagion theory or groupthink. Social contagion theory argues about how people act when they get into groups and how that might be different than how they would act independently. In particular, people who believe in the social contagion theory argue that the members of the group can influence collective behavior. Group members may feel anonymous within the group, and this anonymity may lead them to diffuse their own degree of responsibility for the behavior that they exhibit. Within this context, people become more susceptible to influences by other members of the group because they're subordinating their behavior to what other people are doing. And third, given the prevalence of gangs in particular areas, we could surmise that the environment plays a role. 
Social disorganization theory, for example, provides an understanding of how cities can create crime through the lack of opportunities for successful advancement in the labor market and poor cohesion among the members of the community. A final explanation might be that all these factors all kind of work together in some kind of a blend. Don't know what we would call it. Maybe a Nomi theory or something. Uh, Decker and Van Winkle in 96 proposed that we examine how individual group and community factors all interact to predict involvement in gang delinquency. Another area of crime that gang members are often involved with is drug-related crime, right? Research finds gangs can be very organized in their approach to trafficking drugs. Others find most gang members use or distribute drugs on their own without involvement from the gang as a formal organization. Some researchers argue gangs can be highly organized and have formal leadership structures that facilitate highly successful drug trafficking rings. Um, in fact, the organization acts like a corporation with profits from drug sales reciprocated back into the organization. Look at Larry Hoover in the Folk Nation, where he was making a quarter of a billion dollars a year in cocaine sales at the high point of the Folk Nation based out of Chicago. So Larry Hoover was one of those people who, within the gangs, was able to orchestrate this fairly complex system of trafficking and drugs with drug mules and carriers and lieutenants and spots and everybody operating according to budgeted sales requirements and bonus systems and being set up and all the rest of the good stuff that went with it. And he had enforcers who kept everybody in check in order to make sure the organization ran smoothly and the product was distributed according to the plan. On the other hand, arg others argue that a lot of gangs are disorganized and don't have a leadership structure in place. They argue a lot of gangs are loosely organized, may have transient memberships, a lot of friction within the organization. Uh, Hagedorn, in 88, interviewed gang members in Milwaukee and argued that gangs he observed weren't well organized and didn't even have a system in place to control their members, and they weren't profitable. Um, you know, I, I agree that that may have been the case in 88 in Milwaukee, but I would not say that that is the case these days uh, at all. So what are the what are the risk factors for gang membership, the consequences of being in the gang? You now, we have to consider the possibility that a lot of these gang members could be early starters, right? Going back to their early starters component of the seminar. These individuals may have been involved in early disruptive behavior, and it's become more serious as a result of their gang membership. They've accumulated a number of risk factors that put them at greater risk for continuing their criminal careers. So if researchers use meta-analysis techniques to study risk factors for crime on this juvenile population who are involved in gang membership, then they're able to identify which risk factors are most important. Uh, Gendro, Andrews, Goggin, and Chantelope in 92 found that the most common risk factors included lower social class origin or poverty, personal distress and psychopathology, educational and vocational, uh, vocational achievement, parental family type factors, temperament and personality, antisocial attitudes, and antisocial associates. The top five risk factors in this whole list were school, family, personality, attitudes, and peers. And gang members are often having trouble with each one of these areas. So the gang can place youth on a negative trajectory that can hamper future opportunities for college and employment and marriage and having some kind of a decent normal life. And as such, these individuals are at risk for becoming chronic offenders who will continue their criminal behavior well into their adulthood. So the concerns regarding youth gang involvement in crime and the potential for these offenders to become chronic and persistent criminals has led to a number of anti-gang programs and initiatives. And we're going to be talking about those in just a moment. But what I really want to stress right now, and part of the cornerstone for what we try to do in our peacekeeper justice model is to look at the family as a part of this process. And we believe that one of the reasons that we have much of the crime we have in this country is due to the breakdown in family. And for whatever reason that this breakdown in family has occurred, whether it be abuse of the spouse, whether it be you know, children uh, having children, whether it be the abuse and manipulation by one over another, uh, whether it be just a parting of the ways, uh, whatever the deal is, 
these kids not having a decent family who can be supportive and protective and caring and uh, provide them with uh, positive examples of how to um, treat others and a positive self-image for themselves, uh, then pushes them out into the school and their peer groups in order to be able to um, identify with who they are. And we really feel as though we need more efforts toward um, re-energizing the family core to the development of these kids so that they don't run into the hands of their gang peers, so that they don't have problems in school, and so that their personality and their attitudes reflect human values toward being successful and pro-social and, and those kinds of things. So that's, that's where the majority of the problems are that we have. But because we don't have families doing what they need to be doing in so many cases, then, you know, the, the government as the parent ego state has to step in and implement programs to be a pseudo parent. And so when we look back on some areas that we've already talked about, we discussed already two main initiatives, the gang resistance education and training program, and we discussed the ceasefire Chicago program. But let's take a look at this uh, youth gang drug prevention program. Now, this was born in the late 1980s when we had a bunch of little gang bangers like these guys uh, running around and uh, causing havoc. And so we designed this program to provide communities with what? Funding. Like, like always, when we have a problem, we throw money at it because we assume that the government's going to be able to do a better job than everybody else. And the funding provided to agencies the development of a range of programs, which included peer support, education, monitoring, crisis intervention, recreation programs, and, and all the rest. But uh, unfortunately, what we found out was that uh, this was ineffective, ineffective at reducing gang involvement, because we didn't take care of the family. The family is not listed anywhere in there. And because these kids didn't have a family, all we did was surround them with a bunch of non-measured, non-outcome-based measured uh, programs where we were, you know, basically just spinning our wheels and, make, and aggravating the situation, making it worse due to our own lack of effective technique. So then what do we do? I mean, this was a, this was a Kriptown wall, a Seatown wall that I took a picture of uh, a while back. Um, and this is what the gangs refer to as a roll call wall where all of their members' initials are on it and they kind of lay claim to their territory. So then what, what did we do? We said, well, okay, the 80s, we struck out there. Let's, let's try something else. And in the 90s, the OJJDP, seeing what happened during the 80s, developed the comprehensive gang model. Now, with this one, we had a little bit more success. Uh, it was originally implemented in Chicago. It's now operated in a lot of other states. But what the comprehensive gang model targets is five specific areas. One is community mobilization, involvement of the community, uh, opportunity provision, which means the development of education and employment training, and then ding, 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 social intervention, services linking to schools, service agencies, and would you believe it or not, families. Okay, then suppression, which was the formal supervision and monitoring of gang activity. That's the enforcement branch. That's the police. And then organizational change and development policies and procedures that are directly tied to the gangs that we're trying to do away with. So results of the pilot in Chicago indicated that this model could be effective. It did get the green light in reducing criminal activity and gang involvement by the youth in the study as published by Spurgle in 2007. The model was expanded to several other states, but like anything else, uh, the proof in the pudding as to the effectiveness of the comprehensive gang model was that it had to be implemented appropriately. And the uh, implementation of this was the most influential issue impacting this as some kind of a social treatment program. So in 2010, the OJJDP issued a report, which they called the best practices to address community gang problems. 
And the report advocated for the five areas that you see here in the comprehensive gang model, but it also noted that communities have to be organized and mobilized around the needs of the youth. The OJJDP, OJJDP argued for early interventions, prenatal and infant care. Oh, there goes the family again. Identifying at-risk elementary school children to intervene before they choose to join a gang and getting together with their families and getting family support in there. In addition, the report advocated for truancy reduction programs and after-school activities to keep youth active and away from gang members. And finally, it advocated for identifying gang leaders and removing them from the community while also targeting youth who were previously gang involved and are returning where? Home from a period of confinement. So again, I ask for you to remember and focus on family and home as being critical when we talk about what it is we're going to do with these young people rather than criminalizing them labeling them and then having barriers for them for the rest of their lives and what it is that that uh, that happens. This isn't a gang seminar. Uh, we're going to have some later seminars that apply to specific street drug gang uh, uh, organizations and within the prison systems, what we refer to as security threat groups. Uh, this is an overview of juvenile delinquents and juvenile gangs as one of the three specialized populations.